So we're gonna study a story of a man named Moses. Some of you may be familiar with that name. Moses was a man of God there in the Old Testament. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. We see many, many books and stories in the Bible committed to him and his life and the great works that God did through him. But in order to understand this story, we have to take a history lesson. We have to go back to the early days there in Exodus when the nation of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. Some of you may know that story. For 430 years, Israel was enslaved there in Egypt. They had a tough go. Many of them were indentured, were in slavery, they were serving, they were committed to advancing the work of Pharaoh. And you can read the stories there in the early chapters of Exodus it was tough for them. And they cried out to God year after year after year. Well, God heard their prayer after 430 years and God spoke to Moses who would be used by God to lead the exodus of God's people out of Egypt and into what is called the promised land. And so God spoke to Moses and you know the story, the, the 10 plagues that landed on Egypt the early chapters of, of Exodus explain that story. And God used Moses mightily to lead the people out in miraculous works. So here is Moses. He's leading the people out of Egypt. Man, it's a glorious day. It's an 11 day journey to the promised land. It was supposed to be. So they, they venture off on this two week journey. And you can read about it there in the book of Numbers. And they land in the, the wilderness of Paran there. And as they're there, Moses has an idea. He goes, hey, let's pick 12 spies, kind of like CIA operatives of their day. And we're going to send them off one man from each tribe. And they're going to go to a place called Hebron, which is about 18 miles south of Jerusalem there, just southwest of the Dead Sea. If you have a map of Israel there in your mind's eye. So we're going to send them up to examine the land, to spy out the land. We want to understand what this land looks like, what challenges we might face. So one man from each tribe was dis dispatched. They were like the CIA operatives, kind of like SEAL Team 1, the original SEAL Team. And they go and they come back and they bring this incredible report. In fact, they brought this cluster of grapes that was so large, it took two men to carry this cluster. They talked about pomegranates and figs better than anything you could find at a farmer's market. Man, the, the fruit was lush, man. The, the, it was described as a land flowing with milk and honey. It was that, that appealing to the nation of Israel. It was the promised land. So when they were reporting back to Moses about what they saw on the land, 10 of the 12 spies gave a negative report. They said, Mo, this is a wonderful land. Man, the food is awesome, but there are giants in the land and we're scared of those giants. We're going to view the situation through the lens of fear instead of the lens of faith. And the 10 persuaded Moses to not go into the promised land. There were two men, Caleb and Joshua, who we read about in the Bible. They were the two faithful spies who, man, they saw those giants and they sure in their flesh, they might have been a bit scared, but they trusted God and they viewed the situation through the lens of faith. That's how faith works. We see things through the lens of what is possible in God's hands. And so these two spies who delivered a good report, they were outnumbered and outruled. And so what should have been a two week journey to the promised land turned into a 40 year wandering through the wilderness. And Numbers chapters 13 through uh, 20 describe this four, 40 year period. And Moses is leading these people. And when Moses decided not to charge the promised land, God spoke to him and challenged him and said, Mo, because you aren't viewing things through the lens of faith and the people refuse to accept my promise, 
they're going to die in the wilderness. So I'm going to walk you around in circles there in the wilderness, in the book of Numbers, until every last person dies. But their kids, I'm going to disciple up, and I'm going to let them go into the promised land. So that is the setting of our story this morning. It is 38 years into this 40-year wandering through the desert as our story picks up there in Numbers chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Let's read. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Man, the first thing that happens to Moses here is he's heartbroken. For those of you who have suffered loss of a family member, you know what Moses is going through here. Man, this was his older sister. She was 127 years old. She was the one that saved him when he was a baby. If you recall that story, when Moses was a baby, there was an edict by the Pharaoh to kill every firstborn. But, Mo, but Moses' mom said, hey, I'm just going to put him in a bassinet there, and I'm going to float him down the Nile. And Pharaoh's daughter found Moses that day, and it was Miriam, his older sister, who went and convinced Pharaoh's daughter to raise him as her own. She saved Moses' life. Man, his older sister had just died, and Moses was heartbroken. So he's there, he's dealing with that grief and that heartache as he's called to lead these millions and millions of people there in the wilderness of Zin. And it says there in verse two, now there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. If you've ever had a flashback, kind of a deja vu, this was Moses' deja vu moment. He's in the wilderness of Zin, right here in this city, 38 years previously, they were in that same desert when he dispatched those 12 spies. And the report that came back was very bad. So he's thinking here, I just lost my sister. I'm in this same place and I have a congregation of people that want to murder me. They're thirsty and I tell you, if you're in the wilderness and if you've ever been thirsty, you know exactly what Moses is dealing with. Imagine wandering through the desert. We have a Starbucks on every corner. You could pick up a bottled water on every corner, right? Back then, that wasn't the case. Water was a necessity. And there were millions upon millions of people journeying through this wilderness without water. Our body is comprised two-thirds water. It requires hydration for our, most of our bodily functions to operate. So you can imagine, have you ever been thirsty? I mean, just go, you know, go on a run and on a hot day. I have been that way where I feel like I'm going to faint. And it doesn't take much. Imagine a congregation of people this wasn't just a silent murmur or a whisper. This was an overarching cry by the people and a look in their eyes like Moses was a dead man because there was no water. And what do they do? They blame their leader. They said, Moses, it's your fault. You know, complaining's an interesting thing. These people complained about something significant. What do you complain about? I was challenged by this passage this week. As I look back at my week and I kind of replayed the comments that I've made maybe to my wife or my kids or my coworkers, as I look back and I kind of chronicle the complaints that come out of my mouth, I'm thinking, man, Lord, help me. Help me not be a complainer, Lord. Help me be satisfied with where you have me. It doesn't mean we can't lift up our needs or lift up our prayers, but may we just pause here, take a step back, and ask yourself, are you a seasoned complainer or are you a beginner? <laughs> where are you on the spectrum of complaining? It's something that we have to talk about because, listen, God hears every word and thought we have. And the Bible speaks, interestingly enough, in the book of Psalms chapter, I believe it's 106, there's a story there. And I remember reading this as a college student, and in that season, I was complaining. I, was, I, had, I had forgone a career. I was serving full-time on a horse farm, no salary, no income. I didn't know where my next meal was going to come from, let alone filling up my gas, my, my gas tank in my truck. 
I was, and I found myself in a state of complaint. I was like, Lord, I'm serving you. Aren't you gonna take care of me, Lord? I'm giving my all to you. And I found myself complaining in those early days of ministry there in South Bend, Indiana. And I remember reading the book of Psalms and the Lord just piercing my heart saying, Steve, I need you to turn your complaints to faith and just trust me. Man, I clothe the lilies in the field and look how beautiful those flowers are. How much more value are you for me than those lilies in the field. Steve, I have you in the palm of my hand, but there are some things you need to go through, Steve, that can only happen through the valley of challenge. I need to shape you and form you into a man who trusts me and knows me and believes me when the going gets tough. And that's not gonna happen, Steve, unless I walk you through this journey. And he brought me to this passage where it talked about the nation of Israel complaining in their tents because I was not a public complainer, I was a private complainer. And I thought that was okay. I thought as long as I'm not complaining publicly, I'm okay. And then the Lord just cut me to the heart and said, Steve, I am as concerned with what you say within the confines of your home, where you feel like you have the liberty to complain about him or her or that or it, right? And it was challenging for me because I realized in those early days that God is everywhere. And God wants a heart who is, that is grateful, recognizing him and trusting him at all times. And when I find myself complaining, I'm telling the Lord, Lord, you have it wrong. Uh, I, can you please open up the, the book you have written on my life? Because I think we veered off the script here. You see, God, God has everything under control. These people were complaining. And they went to Moses and they complained and they complained and they complained. In verse three, and the people contended with Moses and spoke saying, if only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Talk about exaggeration there. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals, I mean, come on, God, Fido. I mean, my cat, my dog, I mean, these animals, if you don't care about me, what about the animals that we should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, verse five, nor is there any water to drink. The people had forgotten. Man, God wasn't trying to bring them into this land. They chose this. God said 11 days to get into the promised land and your eyes are gonna see a sight that you'll, that'll just satisfy and satiate every desire you have for, from a physical need standpoint. Man, I'm gonna bless you spiritually so you could stand strong and I'm gonna work a mighty work that the nations around the world are gonna see that you are my people and I am your God. That was God's plan. The people chose a different plan. Sound familiar? You see, God has a plan for all of us, but sometimes we decide to say, I, based on what we see, the fear that creeps in, we go, mm, not for me right now. And we find ourselves wandering through the wilderness, not embracing God's best for our life. It's easy to happen. It's easy to happen where we say no to God because it's hard or we're filled with fear. And God says, I still love you, Steve. You're not embracing my best for you. We're gonna journey and take a detour here. It's not my will for you, Steve, but I'm with you, Steve. I'm with you, but it's not the best the ideal plan I have for your life. And I wonder how many of us here are finding ourselves in that situation. Israel found themselves in that situation. You see, they were viewing the wilderness as God's promised land and God said, I've got something so much better for you. But you see, it wasn't the original gang because 38 years prior, it was the parents who decided not to charge the promised line. By this time, 38 years later, most of those parents have died, had died off. It was their kids now that Moses was discipling. And Moses is probably hitting his head against a rock saying, why Lord? 
Like why the apple didn't fall far from the tree? Because the kids were embracing that mindset that their parents had. Parents, listen up. Your example, your words, your life is observed and monitored by your kids, even your adult kids. Bosses, listen up. Your colleagues at work, your staff, they're watching your example, every word you say, your life is speaking a ministry into their lives. Older siblings, listen up. Your younger siblings are watching you. They watch how much you stretch, you know, the truth and how you live your life and they take cues from how you are living your life and the example that you are setting. Spouses, I can go on and on. Our example matters. And the example of these parents, unfortunately, was so strong that it was passed on to their kids. And instead of being faith-filled, they were fear-filled. They were looking at what their eyes could see and not the God who was leading them. What a powerful reminder for us as they're sitting there and Moses is trying to deal with this group, verse six. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and they fell on their faces. I love this. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. So Moses being wise said, you know what? I'm gonna go seek the Lord because I'm a bit outnumbered. It's me, my brother Aaron, and when they left Egypt, there was approximately two and a half to three million people, commentators estimate. We don't know exactly, they're in the early book of Numbers. We find a number of the men over the age of 18 who were of fighting age, and we can just calculate and extrapolate how many people there were. But when they left, it was about two and a half, three million people, and that number just grew, right? As they had kids, and they had kids, and their kids had kids in this wilderness. So Moses is outnumbered here, standing before a mass and sea of people, and he does what he should do. He goes to the Lord. And he links arm with, arms with his brother Aaron and they fall on their faces. And the Bible says that the glory of the Lord appeared. This is important. Because in the Old Testament, the glory of the Lord was a physical presence. It was like described as a fire or smoke. You could feel it. You can walk into a tent and feel the presence of the Lord. And there was Moses and Aaron on their faces because they needed instructions for what to do next. What a great example, right? When the going gets tough, fall on your face. That's what the Lord wants. When, thing, when you don't have answers to the questions, fall on your face, because the Lord's presence will be there. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is James 4, 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And I'll, I've never forgotten that verse. Because when I take a step towards God, he's sitting, he's, he's in heaven, he's everywhere. But when I take a step towards him, God says, oh, my boy Stevie is taking a step towards me. I'm gonna take a step towards him as well. My son is wanting my attention and I promise to give it. It's who he is. God is into relationship with us. When we go to him, he's there, he's wonderful. He's a wonderful counselor, the Bible says. And Moses needed counsel here. So he fell on his face. The Lord's presence was there. Then we read in verse seven and eight. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. And I want you to speak to the rock that is before their eyes and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and to their animals. <sighs> Music to Moses' ears. God's hearing them and he has a solution. Mo, I want you to take that rod. Now this was a famous rod. It was that rod that Moses used to part the Red Sea. It was the rod that he threw at the feet of Pharaoh that turned into a serpent. It was the rod that blossomed there in the Old Testament. He said, I want you to take Aaron's rod, your brother's rod there that I have worked through, man, that wood, that stick. I want you to take it 
and I want you to go up to the rock. Now, interestingly enough, there was a rock there that Moses' attention was, was kind of pulled to. And the Lord said, that rock there, Moses, take that rod and I want you to speak to that rock. Speak to it and I promise to bring just torrents of living water from that rock. So Moses walked away and he was like, this is cool. <laughs> the Lord is about to work again. So verse nine, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? The Lord is sitting here going, no, 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 Mo. That, that's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to speak to the rock. Moses went from a place of being surrounded by the glory of God's physical presence. Man, he had a spiritual high, man. He walked out of that tent with Aaron and he was like, the Lord is going to work. Have you ever been there? Where you're just, man, just you walk out of church maybe and the Lord spoke to you. And then you get in the car and things change. For most of us, it's the opposite. We wake up Sunday mornings and we're yelling at our kids to get ready so we're not late. And then you get a play-by-play -play commentary on how bad your driving is by everyone in your family. By the time you get to church, you're pulling up and the mood in your car is not that of worship or praise. You walk out of the car, you lock it and you smile. And you say, I'm glad I'm at church. Can, can anyone relate to me? Yeah, that's happened on more than one occasion, right? For many of us, it's the opposite, man. It's chaos, it's crazy. We come into church and it's like, wow. Here, I'm gonna hear the Lord. I'm gonna sense the Lord. I'm gonna walk out filled. Moses walked out filled, man. He was in God's presence and then he sees the people and they were complaining. And Moses' anger got the best of him. In fact, many speculate that this Hebrew word that Moses used was the word by which we derive the term moron. So he was calling them rebels or morons this day. It wasn't a compliment. But he did it in such a way where he misrepresented the Lord. No doubt screaming, his veins bulging, just angry, his face red as a beat. And he's sitting there yelling, you rebels. You can just picture it in your mind's eye. And God's heart is broken. It's broken. Because God gave Moses clear instructions. And Moses decided to respond to the things he saw and not the one who was seeing the situation and leading him. Before we get to, you come down on Moses, listen, I'm the same way. Perhaps you are too. We're weak. We know what we're supposed to do, but we also, like Moses, find ourselves not responding to God's word. And we respond in ways that unfortunately break the heart of God because we're fallen, it's in our nature. Moses is no different. Moses was an incredible man of God, but he was human. And we have a tendency at times to take God's ministers, God's people, whether it's a, a man or a woman who is prominent in the Christian stage, and we hold them to a higher standard than we hold ourselves. Listen, I get it. We should be called to a higher standard if you're a preacher of God's word or if you're you know, being used by God to represent him. But we're all held to the same standard of holiness. And beware of the tendency to pick other people apart and not use that same standard on your own life. I learned early on that behind every struggle of every individual is a mirror that's pointing right back at me saying, Steve, you are that man or woman too. And you need God's grace as much as they do. You see, Moses here lost his temper and he called them rebels. And then he went on to say, he, he, it's, it's as if he forgot the time he spent in the tent with God. He said, must we bring water from this rock? What's wrong with that statement? God's thinking, Moses, last time I checked, I was the one bringing water from the rock. You don't have the ability to do that. But Moses here, he lost perspective and it's easy to do that. He lost perspective and he lost track of the mission that God had called him to. He wasn't thinking clearly. What's interesting is that Moses in the Bible, 
is described as the meekest man, the most humble man on the face of the planet. How do we know that? Because he wrote that about himself. <laughs> he did. Moses, inspired by the Lord, wrote that he was the meekest, most humble man on the face of the planet. And we see the pattern of Moses' life, and it was one of meekness. He was humble. He was a great example, but he was human. He lost his temper. And it wasn't the first time he lost his temper. If you recall back in the days of Egypt, when God was stirring his heart to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt, you recall he saw a Egyptian supervisor beating and whipping a Hebrew slave. And if you recall your Bible, Moses went and anger filled him and he murdered that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. You might recall the story too of Moses being on Mount Sinai where he was receiving the Ten Commandments. And man, God was writing on those rocks, on those tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments that we know. And Moses came down from that mountain and he saw the people dancing around an idol. And Moses' anger got the best of him. You rebels. And he threw those Ten Commandments down and they just were crushed to pieces against the rocky mountainside there that day. So while Moses was meek and he was humble, Moses was human. And we see several examples of Moses losing his cool. And unfortunately, this was one of them. This was one of those moments. Verse 11, but it gets worse. Then Moses lifted his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. Uh-oh. And water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank. What was Moses' instruction? Speak. And what did Moses do? You rebels. And he struck the rock not once, but twice with that rod of Aaron. What does God do? God still blessed the people. Anytime I think that God's grace isn't rich or deep or big enough to really reach someone or reach me, I am reminded of this story. Man, everything went wrong. Moses like did the exact opposite. And God in his goodness said, I'm still gonna bless because my goodness is not dependent on man's goodness or faithfulness. God is so good. He is so, so good to us. He is gracious and loving and compassionate. He has, he, he, his sensitivity towards us is beyond anything we can ever comprehend. And I believe when we get to heaven, we're all gonna stand there amazed because we're gonna see God in 4D, like clearly without any filters. And we're gonna say, Lord, I wish I would have seen you this clearly when I was down on earth because I would have lived my life a lot differently, more to your glory, not mine. So here, Moses struck that rock twice, erroring, and water still came out, verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the end of the road for Moses. God said, Moses, that's it. I love you. I'm still with you. But this is the last straw, Moses. And because of this incident, Moses was barred from the promised land. And if you read on in the story, you'll find that Joshua becomes the successor. He was one of the two spies who came back full of faith, believing that God would give them that land. And Moses, we find, is taken to the edge of that promised land and he dies on a mountain. But God is so good. You see, God sneaks him in later on in the New Testament. They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know the story when Jesus is there and he's transfigured and the three disciples are there who do we see? We see Moses and Elijah. Moses eventually got to see the promised land and step, he stepped foot there on that mountain. God in his grace, right, still gave Moses entrance, but for the purposes of the Old Testament, in his earthly physical life, Moses was barred from the promised land because it was bigger than just losing his anger. It was bigger than just losing his cool and misrepresenting God. We all have those moments, right? 
where we lose our cool or we might follow a path that we ought not to, God's grace is big, right? There are consequences to sin. I'm not negating that, but God's grace and love is there. But what Moses did was significant. Follow me here. God told him, speak to the rock, Moses, and I will bring torrents of water from that rock. For you see, 38 years prior to this story, Moses was standing in the same spot with that same rock next to him. There's two stories of the people grumbling and complaining to Moses that they didn't have water. Well, in Exodus chapter 17, prior to this story, 38 years prior to the story we're studying, the parents of these kids were complaining to Moses. And Moses went to the Lord. And the Lord said, Moses, I want you to take that rod and I want you to strike that rock. And water's gonna come out of that rock. And so Moses took the rod he struck the rock and the people drank and were merry. 38 years later, he finds himself in the same spot with the kids of those parents in the same predicament. And God says, don't strike the rock, Moses. I want you to speak to the rock. And what did Moses do? He struck the rock. Moses was ruining a typology, a picture that we can't miss here. For the book of 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, you can jot it down, tells us that the rock that followed Moses and the nation of Israel through the wilderness was none other than Jesus Christ. The rock was Jesus. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So the first time this rock is there. God says, Moses, take that rod and strike that rock and water will flow. But the second time, speak to that rock. Moses, you're not going into the promised land because this is a picture of my son. Jesus is the rock. He was whipped and scourged beyond recognition. He took a beating on that cross for your sins and my sins. He was beat beyond recognition and he died once. And he was resurrected in glory and resurrected in power. And now we don't go to him. He's not crucified again. We speak to him as in a relationship with him. And Moses, you're ruining this picture. The rock was struck once, a picture of Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary. And now you enter a relationship with him and you talk to him, you speak to him and he speaks to you. Moses ruined this typology and he misrepresented God in this moment. But there was a greater picture that God was trying to communicate. And that was a picture of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, an incredible picture. And Moses got it wrong. And as we study and examine this story, we might each have our own thoughts about Mo. But you know, Moses was human. And God in his grace blessed the people with water. And he communicated to Moses the significance of this illustration that he was seeking for Mo and the people to receive. And that is, it's bigger than water, it's bigger than thirst. It's about my son, Jesus. And as the worship team comes up here, they're gonna lead us in a song. We're getting ready to take communion. And as we prepare for communion, I'm reminding myself of the gravity of this moment. The book of Corinthians tells us, in the book of Corinthians tells us that those of you who approach the communion table, don't approach it lightly. If you take communion and you're not a believer, meaning you haven't surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ or you're walking in disobedience, the Bible says you bring judgment on yourself. Our taking of communion means that we're identifying and receiving the broken and bruised body.
body of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. I am the bread of life. I was that rock that was struck. And for those who accept that and believe that, I want you to remember me through communion. Father, we're forgiven because of the work you did on that cross, Lord. And Father, we took this communion, Lord, with thankful hearts, Lord, recognizing our sinful nature and our need for forgiveness, Lord. And we're so thankful that you sent your son to die on that cross, Lord, to be struck and bruised on our behalf, Lord. It was he who took the punishment that was owed to us, Lord. And as you died there and were resurrected three days later, Father, we too follow in newness of life, Lord. We're new creations, Lord, and we're thankful for that. And Father, help us live as new creations, Lord. Speak and minister and challenge us, Lord. May we walk away from this service, Lord, with our eyes fixed on you, believing you're leading us, that you're with us in our cars, you're with us at the lunch spot, you're with us in our homes, Lord. And Lord, you desire depth and intimacy with us, Father. So Lord, bless your people, Lord, I pray. Bless us, Lord. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people say, amen, amen, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. Listen, God is good. And when we leave this place, may we embrace our calling to serve him and love others. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord here this morning. God bless you.